Chapter 6 On Vivacity and Cheerfulness Of other cordial disciplines of the Salat and other worships, one which has good results, or rather it opens some doors and uncovers some secrets of worships, is that the Salik is to try to worship with vivacity, cheerfulness of the heart, and gaiety of mind, and to avoid laziness and reluctance in performing worships. He is to choose for worship a time in which he is quite prepared to perform it with animation and freshness, feeling no tiredness or lassitude. Should one force oneself to worship in times of laziness and tiredness, it would probably bring about bad consequences, such as feeling tired of worshipping and of taking the trouble and bearing difficulty. Then, gradually, one may feel disgusted with worshipping. Furthermore, it may possibly turn man completely away from remembering Allah and give pains to the spirit from the state of servitude, which is the source of all happiness. Such worship will bring no luminosity to the heart, and the inside of the soul will not have any reaction, and the image of servitude will not become the image of the inner heart. It has already been said that the aim of worship is that the inner soul should become the image of servitude. We now say that one of the secrets and results of the worships and austerities is that the will of the soul becomes operative on the realm of the body and its authority is overcome by the majesty of the soul and is annihilated and the forces and soldiers spread in the kingdom of the body can no longer revolt, disobey or be obstinate and selfish. They actually surrender to the inner kingdom of the heart or rather those forces gradually dissolve in the invisible heavenly domain, and its command is effective on the visible dominion. The will of the soul gets stronger and takes the reins of the kingdom from Satan and the commanding soul, and the soldiers of the soul are driven to submission, from submission to contentment, and from contentment to annihilation. In this situation, the soul will get to discover some secrets of worship and some actual manifestations will appear. But all these cannot be implemented unless the worships are performed cheerfully and actively, away from every sort of laziness and carelessness, so that a mood of affection and love towards remembering Allah the Exalted and the state of servitude with familiarity and consistency happen. Loving Allah and remembering Him is one of the great affairs which is very much cared for by the people of knowledge and is a subject of competition among the people of Saluk. Physicians believe that if food is eaten with cheerfulness and gaiety, it will be digested much easier. Similarly, psychiatrists stress that if the spiritual nutrition is taken cheerfully and enthusiastically and with avoiding laziness and affectedness, its effect will appear very quickly in the heart and the inner heart will be purified more quickly too. This discipline is referred to in the glorious divine book, the upright lordly pages, as it, in defiance of the disbelievers and the hypocrites, says, and they do not come to Salat unless they are sluggish, and they do not spend unless they are reluctant. And the noble ayah, O you who believe, do not approach the Salah when you are drunk, the word drunkenness is explained in a hadith to mean sluggishness. Some narratives refer to this discipline. By relating some of them, we shall give pride to these papers. Muhammad ibn Ya'qub quoted Abdullah, Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, to have said, Do not force yourself to worship. Abu Abdullah, a Sadiq alayhi salam, also quoted to have said, The Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, has said, O Ali, this religion is firm. Get into it mildly and do not cause yourself to hate worshipping your Lord. Imam al-Askari is quoted to have said, When the hearts are active, confide in them and when they are reluctant, bid them farewell. This is a general instruction to deposit in your hearts any information you may when they are lively and gay and leave them alone when they are restive. So, in acquiring knowledge, ma'arif, and sciences, this discipline must also be applied, and the hearts must not be forced when they are irresponsive. It can be deduced from this and other hadith that there is another discipline, 
which is also an important chapter of asceticism. This discipline is considerateness, mu'arrat, that is, the salik, in whatever stage he is, in scholarly or in spiritual and practical austerities and strivings, must consider his conditions, treat his soul with kindness and care, and avoid burdening himself with more than it can bear, especially the young people and the inexperienced, to whom this discipline is quite important. If the young people do not treat themselves considerately and kindly, and if they do not meet the needs of their nature through lawful ways, they will be subject to a greater danger, which cannot be compensated. The danger is that when one is too severe with oneself and pulls the reins too hard, they will break off. And then the will gets out of control, and the accumulated natural needs and the sharp fires of desire under unlimited pressure of austerity burn out the whole kingdom. If a salik's reins break off, God forbid, or an ascetic person becomes unable to control himself, he will fall so deep in a precipice that he can never see the face of rescue, nor can he ever return to the road of happiness and righteousness. Thus, a salik, like a clever physician, has to feel his own pulse during his progress on the journey and to treat himself according to the requirements of the conditions of the journey. When the flames of desire, which are the vanity of youthfulness, blaze high, one is not to completely prevent his nature from getting satisfaction, but one has to resort to lawful ways to put out the flames of his desire, as gratifying the desire according to the divine command is a complete help among the journey to Allah. So, he is to marry, as it is one of the great divine laws, which besides being the base of the survival of the species, has a great effect on the journey to the hereafter too. For this reason, the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said, He who marries will keep half of his religion. Another hadith says, He who desires to meet Allah pure, let him meet him with a wife. The Messenger of Allah وسلم, is quoted to have said, Most of the people of hell are singles. A hadith from Amir al-Mu'minin Ali alayhi salam says, A group of the companions abstained from women, their wives, and from eating in the daytime and sleeping at night. The Messenger of Allah وسلم, was informed about them by Umm Salama, his wife. He came to them and asked them, Do you reject women, your wives? I do go into women, my wives, eat in the daytime and sleep at night. Whoever disregards my tradition is not of me. Allah the Exalted has revealed, O you who believe, do not forbid the good things which Allah has made lawful for you, and do not transgress. Surely Allah does not love the transgressors. And eat of what Allah has provided you as lawful and good, and fear Allah in whom you believe. Generally speaking, the traveller along the road to the hereafter is to be considerate with respect to the ups and downs of the soul, and while he is never to curb the needs of his nature, which otherwise would cause big mischief, he is also not to be severe nor to exert pressure upon himself with respect to worship and practical austerities, especially during his youth and on starting the journey, as otherwise this will also cause the soul to feel exasperated and bolt away and perhaps lead him to abandoning remembering Allah. This point is frequently referred to in the noble hadith. The noble Al-Qafi, quoting Imam Sadiq salam says, During my youth, I was seriously and earnestly doing my worshipping. My father told me, My son, act less on that, as when Allah the Exalted loves someone, he will accept his little. Another hadith goes almost the same. The same course relates another hadith to the effect that Abu Jafar, Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam, Quoting the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam says, "Surely this religion is firm, so go deep in it with mildness, and do not cause Allah's servants to hate worshiping Him. Otherwise, you will be like the ones whose mount was too tired to go on, so he neither finished the journey nor preserved the mount." Another hadith says, "Do not cause yourselves to hate worshiping Allah." However, 
the criterion for being considerate is that one should be observant of his soul's conditions and act according to its strengths and weakness. When one's soul is strong and able to perform worships and bear hardship with good endurance, he should then try to perform the acts of worship. As to those who have crossed the prime of life and the fires of their desire have subsided to some extent, it is suitable for them to increase their ascetic austerities and to set foot on the road of self-discipline with manly vigilance and industry. The more they accustom themselves to ascetic practices, the more doors will be open to them until the soul gradually overcomes the forces of their nature which will be subjugated to them under the majesty of the soul. Concerning the noble hadith which urge the people to strive earnestly in worshipping and praise the people who do so with reference to the worships and austerities of the imams of the Islamic guidance, as well as the noble hadith which recommend economy in worshipping and praise it. Both categories are based on the different people of Suluk and the ranks and conditions of the soul. The general criterion is the vivacity and the strength of the soul or its weakness and aversion.